Hello, I'm Josh Rivers, the creator and host of Busy Being Black, the podcast exploring how we live in the fullness of our queer Black lives. The show is a growing compendium of queer Black voices and centers conversations with those who have learned and are learning to thrive at the intersection of their identities. On the invitation of my G-Work, I'm in conversation with a young Black king, Dan Yomi. Dan is a recruitment consultant, social enterprise entrepreneur, and founder of Living Free UK, an organization that supports and validates lived experiences of queer Black Africans, as well as those seeking asylum in the UK. He's also the founder of Queer Career Hub, an initiative aimed at providing support for queer Africans in Africa and volunteers on the board of directors of House of Rainbow. His YouTube show, Living Free with Dan, dispels myths around African queerness and mental health through enlightening and vulnerable conversations with queer Black people of the African diaspora. Dan, thank you so much for being here. Oh my God, I'm lost in that intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you for having me. It's good yes. to be with you, Josh. Yes, you know, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm very <laughs> proud of everything you've, you've done and built and, and the man you've become. I think you're remarkable. Thank you so much. And thanks for the continued support. You know, it's because of people like you that, you know, give us that drive. So and I'm happy to be here. Good. I'm going to start with a question I ask all of my guests on the show. How's your heart? Oh, wow. Heavy. Yeah, it's it's been a couple of insights, of course, you know, being Nigerian and having friends back home who have been directly impacted, you know, by police brutality, um, but also family as well. And then just seeing everything go through on social media, specifically the shootings on the 20th of October, I was shaking. Um, I think since then I've been wondering, has it, has it gotten any better? There's been protests, there's been petitions, but not much has really happened. Awareness has been great. Um, I think just that mere fact of it could be anyone, you know, whether you're here in the diaspora, um, you know, you could travel back home and then I don't know, probably get killed or tortured. So I think the need to continue fighting is so important. So it's been, um, it's been hard, yeah. And of course, Buhari has now helped matters with his speech. Not even, you know, anyway, we're not here for that, but yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if we aren't here for that, you know, like uh, part of the conversation that I think that has erupted alongside the protests and the raised, the raised awareness around Black Lives Matter um, has also been one about what we carry with us, right? Mm. That we might walk into a professional network space like my G work. And it is, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, we stop being black. It doesn't mean we stop being black. It doesn't mean that we also don't bring with us into that space, our, our concerns about what's happening around us as well. You're I think right, there needs yeah. to be more room for that. You're right. And I, you're right. Um, and I think that day that shooting happened, I'm just so thankful for my boss, you know, um, because I, I couldn't think I couldn't focus on my work. The fact that, someone's mom is just crying or someone's family just in um has been bereaved um yeah so i spoke to him i just i just kind of shaking and of course they need to go on the protest the next day so you are right you know it's as much as my nine to five is being a consultant being professional we come to these workplaces with our baggages you know and i don't stop being black nigerian gay as i walk into or get on that zoom call on that meeting um, and I think you need to mentally focus on your job, um, you know, is important. Yeah. So um, getting better, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say better, but it's just, it's just what's going to happen. You know, the governor of Lagos came on national TV to say no casualties, even though, I mean, over 100,000 people saw that IG lives. It's like, what is the future of Nigeria right now? You know, do Nigerian lives really matter? And of course, the intersectionality of life or queer Nigerians who also have been victims of, of SARS. Um, yeah, it's so my heart is heavy, but you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how things go. I think the interconnectedness of um, the Black experience has really been demonstrated in a really profound way. And it's worth reiterating to, to listeners and viewers um, that what our 
siblings in across Africa are battling against is different from though connected to um, the fight that all black people are fighting really around the world for our freedoms and right to live. And mm. we, had to, we have to be very careful as those in the diaspora not to conflate, right? There was kind of a really big pushback when someone said that Black Lives Matter protests in the, UK, in the US gave way to the protests in Nigeria. And it was just this kind of really a historical understanding of actually, you know, protest movements around the world happening simultaneously, mm. spark, being sparked simultaneously, um, but also independent of each other. Mm-hmm. I think also is, is knowing how each movement could support each other as well, because how they kind of connect. Um, because the one I attended on Sunday was um, organized by, I think, uh, Black Lives Matter. I mean, even with Black Lives Matter, right, we, we know the intersectionality conversation around that, around, you know, a cis straight person gets shot in America, it's Black women and Black trans women going to fights, but actually, if a trans woman gets killed, there's crickets, right? Mm-hmm. And the need for all movements to really recognize the struggles and privileges we all bring to the table and know that what fighting towards one goal, which is equality and, and social justice anyway. Um, so whether it ends SARS in Nigeria or the crisis in Cameroon or in Congo, you know, it, it just knowing that all lives matter in this context, right? Um, and and the need to not even alienate or even um, not recognize the privileges or struggles each of those movements in terms of the locations, right? I fighting from the diaspora, it is a privilege, right? I'm in Lagos. I don't have mm-hmm. to wake up thinking, oh, a policeman could shoot me. Um, but the fact that someone could get killed for even protesting in Lagos makes it feel like a privilege because I don't have to face that, you know, in London, which means I then need to continue doing as much as I can. Um, online protests as well has been very, very effective. Um, yeah, we hear we 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 hear a lot of questions about whether or not social media activism is a thing. Um, what are your feelings about the role that social media plays in these movements for liberation? Specifically with NSAS, right? Because they've been banned like for the fourth time now. I think Nigerians have gotten to a stage of we no longer trust the media, like the the local channels. You know, I mean, DJ Switch was broadcasting live on Instagram. We literally saw someone get killed and channels in Nigeria were showing something else. You know, again, just that agenda to distract people from what's going on. So if it wasn't for Twitter or the continued sustained conversations that's erupted via social media, I don't know what would have happened. But there's also a conversation around performative allyship around, oh, Activism, activism doesn't just stop by retweeting or posting, doing the work is actually important. So it's like, okay, I think they're both equally, you know, they're both equally valid. And at the end of the day, it was that for me, it's about being original, being authentic. You know, I looked to myself and said, why am I doing this in the first place? Um, and a lot of our activism sometimes comes from your personal experience. You know, if you suffer from something, you want to feel the need to change that. Um, so with the NSA specifically, social media has been so, so helpful. In fact, I even think that recently the Nigerian government was going to pass a social, um, social media bill, Josh. It's, it's crazy because it's like, oh my God, these people are now having this tool that will make them, because no one wants, Nigerian government hates international shaming, right? That's, right, that's the only reason they would come and respond to anything. Right, so when the tweets are flying, when the hashtags are going, it, I mean, Jack from Twitter gave us this icon, <laughs> right? So, and there's a, what's his name, whatever, Adamo, whatever, is even planning to say. So that has been so powerful for the Nigerian youth because we no longer feel like the state is for us. Um, so social media has been that, but also it's knowing that it goes way beyond that. And knowing that every form of activism is, is valid, whether it's you protesting on the streets or signing that petition, or retweeting aggressively. That's one word I've seen many, many, many times on Twitter. Um, that both the book value, but again, is knowing the intention behind it because being original has to be key, in my opinion. We should flag also that critiques of um, social media activism can often be quite ableist as well. Um, there will be people who cannot actually get out into the streets for whom it's not safe to protest. 
Um, and so I think that we kind of lose that sometimes in this critique of social media that um, yeah, kind of taking to the streets, as it were, isn't, isn't necessarily possible for a lot of people. Yeah. 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 Um, but even with protest, right? I think, if anything, the, the demographics of people who are at most risk of going on the streets to protest are Black people when they've been in the pandemic, right? And this thing kills us more. Yet we uh, you know, it's like okay, fine, if racism doesn't kill me, COVID will kill me anyway. So I might as well just fight. <laughs> I mean, that was the mindset with which I went to the judge for a protest in I don't know when was that? Well, earlier during the full lockdown, knowing that, you know, I'm asthmatic, when this whole thing starts, I don't know if I get this stuff, I might just die. But also I'm black, according to stats, you know, we're more affected. But then there is police brutality. Right, so if I, I just have to fight because not fighting anything, you probably die anyway. I mean, mm. Brenna Taylor, she was sleeping and she got shot. So you couldn't really escape things like that. But yeah, with, 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 with that critique, I think it's knowing that, you know, every form is valid, you know, whether that person, and it's just giving the people the choice to have their voices heard. So yeah, I would say this as well. I think yeah. it's important. Um, I want to talk to you about allyship. Um, yeah. Particularly because I think that in so many of the discourses and conversations around diversity, inclusion, equality, equity, parity, all of that, um, allyship kind of becomes this thing that white people have to do. Um, right. And it kind of obscures the fact that we among us are also figure, figuring out how to be better allies ourselves. We're also learning, asking questions, making mistakes, mm. correcting mm. ourselves, correcting other people. Um, what have you learned about allyship, um, particularly since lockdown? Has, it, has anything changed for you in your, in your thinking about how allyship is best demonstrated? With regards to race or in general? I think, I mean, in general, like we're at yeah. the intersection of race and sexuality. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, you know, I'm thinking of our trans siblings, for example. I'm thinking of our siblings in the global south. Um, mm. yeah. yeah. And I wonder if you've learned anything that you can share with us about allyship. I think for me, engagement would really stand out, right? Um, because allyship for me is, is, is to continue to be open-minded, listen, learn, and lead from the back, right? So if we're in a room of, I don't know, 100 men, for example, and there's one woman in that room or whatever, it's, you know, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's to know that those 100 men would have to lead, listen from behind, you know? And I think it's just that, and it's been a bone of contention a lot of times around lived experiences, right? Because you see allies, well-intentioned allies who want to do well, but they're not recognizing your place in spaces where you don't really self-identify. It's also allyship, you see? It's not, it's not the donations you make, it's not the protests you've made, you know? Um, it's knowing that in a room full of white people and there's no black person, your voice does count as an ally to speak for us, right? But it's also knowing that in a room with black people, we don't need you to because you then because in my experience right you see people trying to you know again take control and take charge well, no 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 hang on this is not your space you should learn and, and listen here and of course when it comes to our trans siblings i think that's something i personally have had to do my research and i've been blessed with amazing trans individuals who have got taken time you know to educate me to because I do see it as a privilege, right? Because no one should go with an expectation to be schooled, you know, emotional labor. Let's Google, right? So if you find someone who wants to take the time to talk to you, um, it is a privilege. Um, and I think in my conversations also with, with, with gay men and, you know, transphobia comes to play, um, is we're all prejudiced, right? And I think in society, what we're, we're living to unlearn to relearn. Right, and I think one question I ask my gay friends is, "How many trans people do you know in your life? Right? How many?" And nine times out of ten, it's like no one, right? So, but, you know, there's so much power in engagement because regardless of what society tells you, what media tells you, when you meet someone who truly identifies from that group and it and it takes time to explain that experience to you, it does change your mind, right? And that just makes you think, see things differently. And I think that actually cuts across all, like I said, all factors. You know, um, us being cis gay men, you know, is knowing the privilege we bring to the table when it comes to our trans brothers, right? 
um, yeah, when it comes to race and stuff, I think it's just getting that, when I say format, you know, you should listen, you should learn, right? And your opinion should not supersede someone's lived experience because no matter how learned, how schooled you are, and I, I and you see people with, again, me, I didn't, I didn't go to school that much. I only have masters, you know, but then you see someone with- <laughs> Only. <laughs> but then you True see African, someone, yeah. <laughs> you know, you see someone who's like, I don't know, a, a white person, for example, who may have learned a lot about black culture and stuff like that, you know, fine, it's good, you've got the knowledge, but what you don't have is a lived experience because you're not black, you know, and I think it's, it's just understanding that. And that could get very, very draining as well if you're having to explain things like this to people who call themselves allies because that in itself doesn't become allyship anymore. Mm. I love <laughs> this like idea you want to take charge. Um, yeah. Because it means you want to take charge, and I think that's not what allyship is. Allyship should be from the back. Yeah. I love this definition of allyship and, and looking at it through the lens of engagement um, because I always talk about allyship being a, oftentimes a great deal of self-awareness. Who am I in this space, right? Because when we talk about intersectionality and allyship and solidarity what, or privilege and, and how that informs solidarity and allyship, I think people forget that privilege is situational right, that it moves as you move, or it adjusts as, as you move into different spaces. And so this idea of self-awareness to me becomes increasingly important and links to what you said about if you're the only, if you're in a room, if you're a white person in a room full of white people, then okay, maybe speak up for black people not there. But actually, if you're a white person in a room full of black people, maybe be quiet and listen. And that kind of self-awareness to in, in order to engage effectively mm. and appropriately becomes really important. Yeah. yeah, and I think that privilege a lot has really, what, what, what have we all bring privileges to the table regardless of the situation and I completely agree you know me being here coming here as an international student you know my parents being able to afford that is a privilege in itself right me being able to do this interview as an openly gay man right is a privilege it's known that my choir brothers or siblings in Africa in as much as they would love to do things like this it would not be safe for them and it doesn't make them any less queer Right. So again, when I'm engaging with people in as much as, you know, I love the continent, I love my queer brothers, I have to approach it with the privilege in mind because I find I was born and raised in Nigeria, but I'm not currently in Nigeria. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, and I think it's interesting. Again, this has cut across even, my God, the African American discussion, the black, whatever. I don't even think time would even permit us to finish that. I think it's, you're right, it's just that awareness of, I'm in this place, who am I? What privilege do I bring to the table? And our privileges doesn't negate the struggles that we bring. And I think it's being able to have this conversation to say, you have this struggle because I can't discredit your struggle because I feel you're more privileged than I am, because that would be wrong. Because then I'm even trying to, again, define what your experience should look like. Yeah, it, it's um, one of those nuanced conversations so no one feels discredited, but also it, the privilege that we all bring is, is kind of a fact, you know, you can't really deny that. Let's talk about living free. <laughs> Your tremendous contribution to, mm. um, you know, a canon really of ongoing conversations. Um, what's your goal with living free? So, Coming to the UK um, to study, I was still in the closet, right? And even though growing up gay in Nigeria, I never really acknowledged this gay side, right? Because it was never going to be a thing. You know, I didn't aspire to one of them, you know. But then coming here, um, but then going to my first gay club, you know, and then seeing like white gay men like holding hands and being free and I don't know, kissing. It just, it felt different. I was like, oh my God, they're, they're not in hiding. You know, they're not running away, things like that. So I think that kind of triggered this, I don't know, gay side of me. I'm like, oh, it is possible. Um, but then being in Bournemouth, you know, predominantly white and stuff like that, going to those white spaces, again, triggered this other side of my blackness, you know, from the comments I'll get from, you know, white gay men and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, okay, fine. Okay, I'm black and gay. And I think your experience is kind of triggered these things, you know, um, in you. Um, but also, again, it's going to black spaces, but then my cultural side being triggered. So, oh my God, okay, fine. Okay, in as much as these people look like me and I love them so much, 
But I can't really have conversations with them because a lot of the humors, like our childhood experiences are different, right? So when my black British brothers are talking about their TV shows and stuff like that, I can't relate. Right? And I think there's this one time it's so interesting where we were all talking. I was the only, I think, immigrant in the group. And they're like, oh, don't be wet, Daniel. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no. Then I gave, I asked them if they recognize a TV show I watched growing up. And they said, no, 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 no. I'm like, you see, it's called being different, right? I'm not weird. I just can't relate to what you're talking about. So I think the need to have a space where I could be black, gay, and Nigerian was so important, um, you know, whilst obviously going to those other spaces. Um, and Living Free obviously came when I came out two years ago. Um, I started as a show because when I was speaking to my mom, and then she was like, I thought being gay was a white thing. And I was like, but I'm not white. <laughs> I'm black and I'm still gay. <laughs> what am I going to do? You know, I think the need for that space, and I, 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 I was not really offended because she said what she knew and i i, I kind of linked that to lack of you know, representation right because the only thing she was saying with the stereotypes i don't mean are you going to have hiv and stuff i'm like oh anyone can have hiv and also it's, it's no longer a death sentence this is 2020 like you know 2018 like wake up um but also she didn't i didn't have many references to calm her down if that makes sense i couldn't say oh a and b are africans or nigerians are Ghanaians, and they're actually gay I mean, not to say there are not African gay people, but I mean, at that time, I, I just couldn't point openly people who I could use to help my mom, you know, know better. Um, then the show started, um, which, I mean, you've been a guest of, so thank you. <laughs> um, I think the need for that was just to create the visibility I did not have growing up, right? I, I it, Those were really dark days, just knowing that, okay, fine, is this thing in you? I couldn't pull a label to you, but there's no one you could talk to because, you know, everything around you just did it was not possible. And you don't want to speak to your parents about it because then you go to pastor, confession, those nonsense. Um, so I think the show was to just say, I'm going to sit down, speak to someone who looks like me, right? So it's when someone, when that gay boy, you know, lesbian girl, quiet child or poor person in Africa sneaks and just watches some YouTube video, they can know that you can't look like me and be valid. And I think it was more of self-validation, the healing in there, you know, which took me decades to realize. Um, and since then it's grown to uh, becoming an organization. So now we do monthly support groups um, for people seeking asylum, um, you know, and I think it's, it's so interesting, the, the hubs that we do every month, you know, there's this, um, person I use as an example, you know, every time he's 16 from South Africa, right? I know the first time he joined the hub and then he was like, oh my God, I've never seen many people like me before, like that, you know, and he had to sneak into this room and they were just talking. That kind of validity, I didn't have that, you know, and I think just seeing him at 16, knowing that I'm fine. I may be in a very effed up society, but I'm fine, do you know what I mean? I'm okay, right? So when the pastor tells me I'm going to hell, you, you can know that, no, 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 that's not for me, I'm good, you know, um, and we, we, we've grown, you know, so the YouTube show, the monthly support groups, um, the Asylum Corner, and of course, a recent event, you know, um, featuring an all trans, black trans panel, um, at, you know, for Black History Month, I think just that just came from, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we really don't, we, I, a lot of us don't really name black trans black lives, you know, we, we don't mean black queer lives, you know, so when I go on this protest, actually, when I'm on a Black Lives Matter protest, I'm going there to match with black queer people, you know, when I'm on an NSAS protest, I'm going there with my gayness, right, because again, it just helps people in as much, it's a risk, I know that, but then if people don't know otherwise, it won't change minds, you know, um, but yeah, so, it's 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 been it's been a blessing, and I think our recent win now is we recently got funded um, to offer free therapy for up to ten up to six sessions, you know, for Black Africans in the UK. And I think that for me, just when I saw that email, I felt like crying, you know. And then food vouchers for people seeking asylum again. We know how daunting that process can be. Could you now imagine having to go through that in a pandemic? So that is an exclusive and that will be coming out very soon. Um, but that just means the world, because therapy in itself is so hard, you know, because again, we used to think, you know, growing up, being depressed was a sin or things like that. I think a lot of nonsense. And I think it just, it takes self-love to just start debunking those things, right? So to now say, therapy is not a white thing. And it doesn't mean you're crazy. 
it doesn't mean you're weak. <laughs> you know, it's okay to not be okay. And I think having that conversation in a language that my people are going to understand, you know, and then them asking, who am I going to get therapy from? Because again, that's another conversation. I've had experiences from, you know, my friends who have been to white therapists. And if anything, they spend half of the time just explaining their culture <laughs> before even getting to what brought them there in the first place. So I need someone who gets it. Um, it's so, so important. So I think that has been the recent win and of course for that event. So I'm 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 happy and I feel very humbled, you know, to want to create that space for my people. Um, yeah, I mean I'm just thinking like how what an accomplishment it is to mm-hmm. to receive funding to do the type of ex- exactly the type of work that you want to be doing, the kind of interventions that you want to be help cre- help create um within the communities that you seek to impact and i think that's such a key about funding opportunities is that we know what what we want to do and what we can do with our platform and and we should be funded to do exactly that what we think we can do not what some someone else's target is yeah 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 i agree and it's I mean, you get a lot of rejections because, you know, especially when you're new, many funders don't want to take that risk or just take that chance. And I think you just find that person who just sees what you do, believes, and then says, go ahead. You know, it just it just means the world, you know. And to know that, you know, no one is saying you must use this therapy or stuff like that. You must, whatever. Just giving you that autonomy, autonomy to, to make a huge impact to your people because it, they trust your engagement because, you know, matter what, we have lived experiences and I think our experiences have to shape, you know, um, whatever is to come for our community. Um, what, yeah. would you like, um, what would you like my G-Work professionals to, how would you like them to support Living Free? How can they support? I think it would be to get to know us and our members, right? Because a lot of our members are immigrants for example in the uk you know i came to this country on a visa and stuff like that and i think my experience with my with immigration the home office is some something a lot of people born and raised they might not really relate to right i think that can impact us getting jobs for example because a lot of employers really are not aware or they're not they don't have enough knowledge when it comes to employment recruitment you know and those who are not coming with the british passport right and i think that bias in itself you know whether it's in our names or in our accents you know or in the type of visa we come through right to say it may not look like a british passport but it's still valid right and it means something um and i think it takes an employee who wants to do the work to actually say who are these people (laughs) right you know, who are legally in this country, right? But they don't look like this other people that we're used to. And, you know, how can we then engage? Because a lot of us go, because I'm, oh my God, you know, being an international student, a lot can even relate to this. Is even thinking you're not going to get the job before even applying, right? Because you get there, um, because a lot, a lot of um, funders don't understand our um, visa status, for example, um, or can't be keen to even want to, allow us to go through the process because they have to sponsor us and stuff like that. So I think just getting employers to understand the different options, for example, um, but also the, the biases, the unconscious biases that they perpetuate as well, you know, that kind of negatively impacts us. You know, I've, I've been to an interview once where, you know, it was via email, so I, it wasn't face-to-face, and I got through our successful, only to show up on the day, and this boss had the, the secret to didn't let me in because apparently didn't think I could get the role. Um, and I had to call the manager who came downstairs and I could see the, oh, on her face. <laughs> right? Because I know I'm, I'm done. I'm too, <laughs> I'm too, like, actually. So it's interesting because if I had gone to a face-to-face, you know, or if they had spoken, whatever, I may mean, not have gotten that. So I think those, those little, little unconscious biases that employers or corporations perpetuate, um, or even people born and raised there who may have African sounding names, right? There's been a conversation around name privilege as well. I'm Dan, I'm Dan and Asaya. That in itself, it doesn't sound Nigerian or Yoruba, right? And you see someone born and raised there with Adeogun, that kind of thing. Those sort of um, name privileges or name um, discrimination, they happen. Um, but also showing up on an interview and not sounding British or American and stuff like that, and knowing that. And I think that's the conversation I've actually had to say. Um, accent is not a determinant for being intellectual or know what you want to do, right? I don't have to sound 
British. English is English, right? So again, it's just... Yes, <laughs> you think. Um, and so <laughs> I guess that living free is a great way for people outside of, um, within the corporate space, let's yeah. to be specific, it's a great way for people outside of the lived experience of queer black Africans to understand more about what that experience is perhaps like and to see how they might be able to help disentangle some of their biases mm. themselves. Mm, mm. Is, that a, yeah. is that a good summary? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say because, you know, we, we have the membership, we have the lived experience, and I think that engagement would, would, would mean a lot to anyone who cares, <laughs> which obviously my genetic does. So I'm conscious of time, and oh. I'd like to close by asking you a question I ask all of my guests. What do you hope for? I just want every queer African, you know, listening or living, breathing to know that they're okay. You know, I don't want anyone to have to attempt suicide like I did back in Nigeria because I felt I was wrong. Um, I don't want anyone to even try to fast or pray the gay way. Um, And I just hope society becomes a place where people, you know, are just seen as humans because there is more than us. Um, You know, yeah, I, I just, I just hope for the best. I hope for peace. <laughs> I hope to end SARS. <laughs> yes, we all, I join you in all of those hopes. Dan, thank you so much. Um, like I said, I'm so proud of you. I think you're a wonderful yes. human. Oh, um, and I'm so glad that um, queer people get to see your face and, and hear the stories of you and your guests. So thank, thank you for you doing so what much. you do. Thanks for having me. And you, of course, I mean, you know, you inspire me so much, I must say that, right? It's because of the resilience that people like KXU, you know, they give us the strength that we have. So, well done, and thanks. That means a lot. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.